Welcome to the Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast, where we explore how to build freedom through the entrepreneurial process. Our goal is to provide you with the tools and mindset needed to create your lifestyle of independence and flexibility. I'm your host, Ash Whitener, and this is episode 24, Journaling to Freedom, with our guest, Hannah Brame, life coach, author, and CEO of becomingwhoyouare.net where she discusses topics like personal boundaries, self-awareness, compassion, self-responsibility, and much more. Please follow us on Twitter at Liberty E Podcast and Facebook slash Liberty Entrepreneurs. Show notes are found on our website, libertyentrepreneurs.com. Enjoy the show. Hannah, thank you so much and welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Can you give us just a brief background on who you are? Yep. So I am a writer and a coach. I run a website called Becoming Who You Are, which you can find at becomingwhoyouare.net. And I'm a passionate advocate for rational personal development. Great, Hannah. And can you tell us what was your first entrepreneurial experience? So my first entrepreneurial experience was when I was still living at home. I was a teenager and um, this was the very early days of eBay and I got hold of a copy of another eBay user of a um, a specific program that I won't mention what the name is for obvious reasons, <laughs> but I ended up selling bootleg copies of this um, on eBay because I got my own copy from someone, which was a bootleg, and I remember being kind of disappointed with what I got. It was just like a blank DVD, so I was like, I can do better than this. I'll jazz it up. I'll put some labels on it. I'll make it look nice, and I'll undercut them (laughs) price-wise. Right, so basically you wanted some type of piece of software, and you either didn't know where to get it or didn't have the means to pay for it, and you you got it from somebody, and you were like, hey, I can do a lot better job than this, and and you did it. Yeah, it was a very niche TV program, so there wasn't... Mm. A lot of demand for it but that also it was impossible to get it otherwise mm-hmm. on dvd yeah and what year was this oh my gosh early 2000s early 2000s yeah. yeah that that was a time where dvds were starting to come out where the software you could copy them and yeah exactly yeah. yeah um so let's come a bit closer to the present moment i know that you have released a book fairly recently called becoming who you are Um, The book is called The Ultimate Guide to Journaling. Oh, that's right. The website website is Becoming Who You Are. Can can you tell us what the book is about and how you had inspiration to write it? Yeah, so this this venture is obviously a lot more legal. (laughs) 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 And um, basically, I... Through my own personal journey, I went through a bit of a rough time in my early 20s, and something that really helped me during that time was journaling, and that's how I really got into personal development, and that's kind of what started me on the path that I'm on now. And journaling was super helpful for me during that time, and at the same time, although it was really helpful, I remembered wishing at that time, you know, I just wish someone would tell me what to do. I wish someone would tell me how to do this because it's quite a nebulous kind of open-ended thing. And I think sometimes one of the things that can put people off it is not really knowing where to start and not knowing, well, how do I do this? How do I do this in the right way? I appreciate journaling. And before your book, um, I had never really read much about journaling. For me, journaling was a bit of a chore or I would only use it whenever I felt my mental capacity or for my tech friends my mental ram was completely filled up and i you know it was like a, an escape for me instead of a, a healthy regular type of um, activity that i would do can you can you chat a little bit about the different styles of journaling the different styles that you've found useful and just some that you would recommend people do or or maybe not do Yeah, sure. So, um, I mean, I think that's a great point that you made, that journaling is not just something you do when you're having this kind of anxious, anxiety-ridden moment. It's something you can do every day, and I I actually encourage people to do that. It's just to use it as um, a form of checking in with yourself, a form of, you know, even a form of writing down everything that's in your head so you can go and start your day with a clear mind. Um, For that kind of thing, the most useful technique is probably stream of consciousness journaling, which is where you sit for a specific amount of time or a certain number of pages and you just start writing. Mm. Yeah, that's that's the only style that I have any experience with right Mm -hmm. now is, you know, I would get to a point where I I started becoming less free. I felt like in my mental space and I became, you know, interested in 
how do I free up some of my mind so it doesn't have to continue to think about all these things that it continually thinks about? And even in the short time that I've experimented with journaling, I have found there is additional freedom that I can create in my in my mind by even if just writing or typing out some of these ideas that I have, I notice those ideas becoming less and less active or frequent in my own mind. Absolutely. I think we have a great capacity to distort ideas, thoughts, beliefs that we just keep in our heads. It's really hard to get an accurate perspective of things when they're just rolling around in our minds, right? Mm -hmm. We cannot get that distance that sometimes we need to get in order to see situations, even people see ourselves differently. And that's one of the things that journaling really gives us is it enables us to take these things out of our minds, put them on paper, and then go back to them later and think, oh, actually, that's completely different than I thought it was, or actually, I completely see a new perspective on that now. Um, or I noticed that, you know, I'm using this word several times, or I noticed that I sound really angry when I write mm. about this. What's that about? Right. You know, it's a really helpful way of almost seeing ourselves in the way that other people see us, yeah. which in some ways is, um, you know, sometimes that can be a more accurate reflection of who we are because we tend to distort our concept of ourselves, too. <laughs> yeah, sure. When did you start journaling? Uh, when I was a kid. I've been journaling for a long time, but it's definitely changed over, um, over the last sort of, Ooh, two decades plus. Um, initially, it was very much, you know, today I did this, did diary kind of style um, journaling. And then when I became a teenager and I became a very angsty teenager, and then from then it became more, less about what was going on and more about my internal experiences, um, the meanings that I make out of what goes on and the, the sort of deeper stuff. Mm. Yeah, I, I can remember being a little boy, you know, maybe seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years old. And I would see a lot of girls like in my classes at school or something or, or in our group of friends and they would have diaries. And even as a little boy, now, now that we're talking, I can remember thinking, why do all these girls have these diaries and what, what is going on? Why are they writing? What are they writing about? Why do they have locks on them? Right. And why do I not see either myself or my brother or any of my, my male friends at that age, at that young age, actually having diaries. Why, why do you think that is? And did you experience the same in, I think you're from England? Yeah. Right. Did you experience the same in England? Um, you know, I think so, to be honest. For me, keeping a diary, I didn't really look so much at what other people were doing. Um, and I don't think I told that many people, if anyone. I mean, again, it's 20 plus years ago now, mm. so I'm struggling to remember, but I don't remember talking about it that much with other people. It was something that for me was, even though it was quite superficial in many ways, it was always very private. Um, but I think in terms of why it tends to be something that girls or even women gravitate more to perhaps than boys or men is just social conditioning. I think it's socially a lot more acceptable for females to think about their feelings, to talk about their feelings, um, to be aware of their feelings even. I mean, there's definitely um, a, a big stigma, for example, about you know men being emotional. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that is, I think it's seen as maybe a little bit kind of, a little bit almost like navel gazing for guys to Yeah, and it's perceived as weak. You know, it, yeah, you're almost which perceived is as being weak as a guy for journaling. <laughs> yeah. And I think that that could be part of the hesitation in general for men to journal or, or men to express themselves emotionally. Yeah. You know, one, one thought that I'd like to hear your opinions on is this show is about creating freedom in your personal life. And if you're not free of your emotions, you know, how much freedom can you actually have? And I think that this is very similar to what you're doing in the journaling space and trying to help people understand the, the positive benefits of journaling is building a relationship with your emotions sensing more freedom through that experience or that relationship. Absolutely. And this is why I think those kinds of gender stereotypes and the kind of social conditioning that we all have is just ridiculous. And it's incredibly harmful. Whether you're talking about life or business, I think it's really important to be aware of your feelings, um, mainly because whether we're aware of them or not, they are still there. And when we're not aware of them or when we don't allow ourselves to be aware of them because we have this belief that, well, I shouldn't feel angry, which is usually a typical kind of female belief, or I shouldn't feel hurt or in pain, um, which is a kind of more male orientated belief. And that's just a complete generalization there. But those are kind of how the stereotypes that um, 
a lot of us are brought up with. When we don't allow ourselves to feel those feelings or we're not aware of them, they're going to come out in some way. Mm. It's just that we're not going to be in control of them then. Right. Whereas when we can actually acknowledge, yeah, you know what, right now I'm feeling super pissed off or right now I'm feeling really hurt by that what that person did or um, that thing that happened. Um, that's really helpful to be aware of because then we can A, sort of, give ourselves compassion for that and practice you know being nice to ourselves and accepting that and then we can also choose how we respond to it you know i think when we when we don't have that awareness that's when we become reactive and when we do have that awareness we can respond rather than react yeah that's a great point i i know that i'm no master of my emotions and sometimes instead of seeing them as as guideposts you know sometimes they will be the driver of the car that is me and I will be reactive. And I, I can tell, I'm not afraid to tell anyone that at some of those moments, that is when I feel the less free, that, you know, the least free is whenever I feel like my emotions are running me instead of me having the control over some of my emotions and using those to think, well, what, what can I learn about myself at this moment? You know, and using them as signposts and, and not as, as masters. Absolutely. And I think that's a really important point. You know, when I say control, I don't mean that we should have control over our emotions in the sense that we get to choose how we feel. Um, but I think that point that you raised about signposts is really important. I tend to take the belief and use the belief that, you know, when we feel a feeling, even if it's not immediately obvious why, there's usually a very, very good reason for it. Mm. And there's information in that. So that, that's really important to look at as well. Talk to me about your current entrepreneur experience of being a life coach and how you became a life coach and got the experience and what you're trying to do. Yeah, so my when I started out on this path, my original intention was not to become a life coach. I didn't really know what I wanted to do, but um, as often happens for a lot of people, I sort of look back now and I can see exactly how that was always something that I was working towards. Um, so as I was telling you earlier, I've worked or volunteered for listening services for the best part of 10 years now. Um, so, and, and what is that, listening services? Um, so I started off volunteering for a, a UK organization that offers emotional support and guidance for students. Basically take calls on this helpline all night and listen to people. So it was really great experience and active listening, learning how to ask good questions. So questions, um, for example, open questions rather than closed questions. Right, not um, yes or no questions. Exactly, yeah. And then also not leading questions as well. So, um, you know, not assuming that we know what is best for the mm. other person, but really allowing them, like giving them that space to explore for themselves what's the best. Yes, yeah, so, so if I can interrupt, talk, yeah. talk to me about the importance of being a curious person and just having curiosity in general. Uh, I think it's super important and I think this ties in really well with journaling. I think sometimes some of the, the hardest people that it's um, to be curious about are ourselves. Yeah. Um, and certainly the more we can cultivate that with ourselves, the more curious we're going to be about other people. Yeah, I've since I learned about curiosity and I, I credit Stefan Molyneux for helping me understand curiosity. But now I see like the curiosity in myself really wants to be around other curious people. And where I will get quite bored very quickly if you know, somebody's not being curious with me and, and using that skill to help build a relationship with me. You know, I wasn't always a very curious person. And I think because I wasn't a curious person internally, and so I didn't have the, the experience or confidence to be curious externally. Yeah, you know, I think it's an interesting one because I, I appreciate what you're saying. And at the same time, I guess I... I come at this from a perspective that I don't think we can ever demand curiosity from other people or expect it from other people. I think if we want to, we can model it, but I think it's also really important with that to be respectful of people's boundaries. Sure. Um, and I think, you know, in this conversation about curiosity and vulnerability as well, sometimes boundaries, I mean, we're kind of getting a little bit off topic now, but sometimes boundaries are something that really get lost, but they are mm. super, super important. Yeah, I, I see curiosity, I do consider it a language now. And just as I would not expect someone born in Alabama to be able to speak perfect Chinese Mandarin, I don't expect people that were born without curiosity being an importance when they were growing up to speak curiosity as well. So I like what you say about the boundaries because I know that I've overstepped boundaries at times not knowing it because I'm just, I feel comfortable in my own curiosity now and I think I project that onto other people because it's it's so pleasurable for me that I, I want that interaction but mm -hmm. okay let, let's get back on back on task here about the life coaching 
Um, you were working at, what was the name of the place? Where, where you I was a student organization. Okay, in okay. Right. And people would call you for very, people would call into a hotline, I assume, for various reasons. Yep. And you were there asking open-ended, empathetic type of que non-leading questions. Yeah. Um, so from there, I went into the charity sector, or I guess you call it the nonprofit sector in the U.S. And mm -hmm. I worked for another organization for a while, and then I moved. Um, I moved on and worked, worked for a stalking helpline for a while. Um, while all that was going on, I also did a year's training as a counselor. So I'm not a qualified counselor. I'm not accredited or anything like that, but I have that year's training. Um, and. Uh, the reason I stopped after a year is I realized that although I think it's a really truly truly valuable service I've used it myself um, and I think it is really invaluable for a lot of people who are at a certain place in their lives I realized that for me right now with some of the other things I want to do like travel you know for example I cannot be a counselor and travel necessarily because I think if you're going to enter that career path you have a responsibility to your clients to be there and be um, consistent and be stable and that just for me where I am in my life right now that didn't fit with some of the other things that right. I wanted to do so I might go back to that in the future because it was really interesting it was very personally rewarding and fulfilling I learned a ton about myself <laughs> in the process because it's very experiential um, but yeah it just um, and that was what kind of led me to coaching because I was really looking for something that I could do that enabled me to use the skills that I'd learned and to practice similar things and to help people in a similar way but in a very different context so how has your experience not only being a life coach, but understanding all of the aspects and character traits that you, you accrued and learned over the years to be a life coach, how have you found those creating more freedom in your life? Um, that's a really good question. I think, first of all, for myself, you know, I, when I was doing counseling training, I would kind of joke to people, even if you don't want to be a counselor, if you're interested in personal development, I really recommend doing this because it's pretty amazing for your self-awareness. Um, and just for, I think I came out of that with a newfound respect for other people and for, you know, the fact that we're all kind of making our way in the world in the best way that we know how. And yeah, that was just, it was an amazing experience. Um, so that was really helpful for me personally. I think also, you know, I struggle with all of this stuff at times, definitely. I hope in general it has helped my relationships. So I hope it's made me a better listener in my relationships. Um, and it's definitely, you know, now I'm always kind of reading something about coaching or personal development. Um, I take courses in it. You know, I'm always talking to other people who are doing similar things. So it's kind of opened up this whole world for me as well of ongoing personal development. And um, I've forgotten your original question. Yeah, yeah, no, <laughs> no, that's okay. no, that's okay. That's <laughs> okay. Just how it's given more freedom, how it's provided more freedom, this mindset. Yeah. Okay, so I think, yeah, I think there's two aspects of freedom. I think there's the personal freedom piece, which is what I was just talking about, which is freedom to, um, so in particular, the counseling training I did was person-centered counseling, which is very much about um, starting from a place of assuming that you have everything you need to be the person you want to be. So you're not broken, you don't need to be fixed, there's nothing wrong with you. It's just a question of creating this environment where you can really be yourself and you can embrace all the different aspects of yourself. Um, and there's a lot more kind of theory to it than that that's super interesting. And if you're interested, I really recommend checking out the theory of person-centered counseling. But that was a lot of personal freedom for me because that was something that historically I found really hard. And I think it's something that a lot of us struggle with. It's, you know, we all have these shadow sides, these aspects of ourselves that we are either raised to believe are unacceptable or we worry that, you know, oh, if somebody finds out about this aspect of me, they're just going to hate me or then they're going to laugh at me or they're going to think it's not acceptable and so on. Um, and that was really helpful for sort of learning to integrate um, or beginning the constant process of integrating those different parts of me. Um, so that's the personal freedom piece. And professionally, like I said, you know, I love to travel. We're recording this in Panama right now. Yeah. Um, obviously, I would not be here. I'm from the UK. I would not be here if I was doing the counseling thing. Um, and if I take in a different path, so I think professionally, it's and just in terms of life, it's given me an opportunity because I work online to um, lead a fulfilling life. So I love kind of writing stuff that's going to help people. I love creating stuff that's going to help people. I love helping people kind of 
live their life in the way that they want to without you know any dogma or doctrine um any sense of like you should do this because this is the right way to live i love pe helping people find that out for themselves um and i also love traveling and i love being able to go where i can go and go where i want to go and explore all these different places and cultures and love spanish and all this kind of stuff so i feel like you know where i am right now is a great marrying of all these different things that i like to do yeah it i mean as for a business sense it makes a lot of it makes a lot of sense how you have create more freedom for your life. I think more so it, interesting to me is the personal sense that journaling has opened up for you and, and listening and, and being a life coach. And it's very easy for me to see where that's, that's something that your clients or the people that read your book can incorporate into their own life and actually start creating freedom in their own life the first day that they start getting into this and start journaling and start thinking, hey, no, I'm, I love I love what you said. I'm not broken. I don't need fix. Because I think a lot of people believe that. Like, oh, I, I've got all these things that I have to fix about myself and then I'll be happy. Giving them an outlet to actually control what they can control, which is their own personal thoughts about themselves, mm -hmm. and, you know, and getting that type of confidence back. Whereas in some of, some of the other even guests on the show, it's not as a direct relationship between the freedom that they're helping their clients see where mm -hmm. you are helping your clients actually have action items that they can do in three or five minutes a day, possibly that could bring a lot of freedom to them. What advice would you give someone who is either a looking to write a book or starting to learn journaling? Um, so I th I'm going to take each part of that question differently because sure. it's slightly different. <laughs> um, so starting with the writing piece, um, this, this is a really good question because there is so much advice. Um, writing a book is an intensely rewarding experience and at times an intensely frustrating and demotivating <laughs> experience. <laughs> so um, I think it's, it's important to be aware if, you, if you're not having such a great time, whatever stage you're at in the book writing process, that's fine. That's just part of the journey and everybody talks about that. Um, but the number one piece of advice I would give if you want to write a book is to just start writing. Um, and, you know, it's like if you want to be a writer, you've got to write every day you've got to make it so that if someone were to look at how you spend your time they will say i think that person really likes writing or i think that writing is really important to that person um because i think quite often you know we can have these ideas like i really want to do this and it can be genuinely something that we really want to do but sometimes it's hardest to take action on the things that we most want to do because there's always that kind of sense of uncertainty and risk there that, oh, if I take action on this and this actually isn't the thing I want to do or it's not all I think it's cracked up to be, well, what do I do then? Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes it's easier to live with that kind of idea than actually taking action. But yeah, that's my number one piece of advice to anyone who wants to write anything, whether it's a book or a blog, um, a memoir, you know, a fiction book is just to get writing and make it a daily practice. Yeah, let, let's relate that to journaling very quickly because I, I know that I, I was reading in your book and as well as my own personal life where I'll have hesitations to writing yeah. or journaling. And, you know, it sounds like the same advice you're giving someone who would want to write a book is the same as journaling. Like, you know, just start journaling. Yeah, absolutely. That That is true. And, you know, for journaling, I think the most important thing also is don't try to refrain from judging yourself. You know, we all have these very judging minds that are constantly... And, and I mean, I, I'm not one of these people, these kind of personal development people, like new agey people who's like, oh, you should just get rid of all your judgments completely. I don't think that's realistic. Of right. course, we're all going to have judgments about the world around us. And that's ultimately what's helped us survive for so long as the human race. <laughs> so I'm not going to say stop judging yourself completely. But one of the things that can be very challenging with journaling, um, writing about stuff that is really personal and important to us is to shelve that inner critic just for a few minutes even. Um, and when we're writing stuff, not to have that voice going on in the back of our head saying, this is shit. What are you doing? You sound ridiculous. You know, right. What are you wanting about now? You know, that, that whatever yeah. your personal inner critic says, um, it's just to practice shelving that and to really give yourself space to express whatever comes up, whether it's you think it's boring, um, banal, uh, really unacceptable, like, oh my gosh, what if somebody reads this? Like, what are they going to think of me? It doesn't matter. But just giving yourself that freedom of expression, I think that is the most important thing with journaling. And so let, let's say I've started to journal, you know, I'm, I'm journaling every few days, but I haven't really built too much momentum how important is momentum in the journaling process and just start to becoming okay with the fact of allowing these thoughts to come through my head and me taking the action of writing them down 
Momentum is important in journaling and anything we do in life because the more momentum we have, the more motivation we have to continue. Um, we usually think of it as the other way around, that we need to have motivation in order to get momentum, but actually it's, that's backwards. Once we have momentum, we will feel more motivated to continue. Um, and I think that's especially true with journaling because once we get used to the fact that it's okay to express ourselves, um, I know what a lot of people experience and I have definitely experienced is if I break that cycle, if I fall off the bandwagon, so to speak, for right. a bit, um, it's a lot harder to restart because I've almost got to retrain myself to shelf my judgments um, again. So I think I'm, you know, I, I don't like to be dogmatic or prescriptive about these things. I think, you know, whatever floats your boat, whatever works for you, that is the most important thing. But there's definitely a lot to be said for having consistency and trying to do it. If not every day, then more days than not. Right, right, right. Um, Hannah, that, that was unbelievable um, interview. I'd like to wrap up here. I know we're both on a bit of a time crunch today, yeah. but I do have uh, a few rapid fire questions for you. Mm -hmm. What is one of your most influential books? Um, personal development wise, there's a great book called On Becoming a Person by Carl Rogers. And, um, you know, I was talking about gaining a newfound respect for other people and respect for the kind of personal journeys that we're all on in our own ways. Um, that is the book, I would say, that has shaped my thinking most. And what's the name of it again? It's called On Becoming a Person by Carl Rogers. Okay, we'll definitely put that in the show yeah. notes. Who has been an influential entrepreneur or just role model in general for you? I don't think I just have one. Um, I've never stuck with just one role model for anything. <laughs> um, I feel like I should say my husband, first of all, because he has been. Um, certainly, as I've been starting my business, you know, he has, and he's been on your show, I've yeah. seen by the time that we're, um, yeah. you're posting this. Right. Um, Jake, he has been really helpful to me as I'm starting my business. Um, and also, he's a lot more practical than I am. So, uh. <laughs> that's been very helpful. So, he's he's been a huge influence, certainly, on how... Um, how I've kind of, um, the stuff that I've learned about my business essentially, because, you know, I wanted to become a coach and what I found very quickly was that wanting to be a coach and running a coaching business are two entirely different things Absolutely. and entirely different skill sets. Yeah. And if you want to do something that is not, if, if you think, oh, I want to set up a business in this and that this is not business related, it's really important to remember that you cannot just be a coach. You cannot just be a writer. You cannot just be, I don't know, a public speaker. You've also got to be a business person. That's right. Um, so he's been really helpful with that aspect of it because I was not so knowledgeable about that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when I started. And, and, and that she's speaking about Jake DeSillis, who was a previous guest on the show who wrote the book Becoming an Entrepreneur. Um, yeah. And do you visit blogs or where do you get your news from? I do not read the news because it's depressing I and, agree with <laughs> and I don't l tend to get anything from it. Um, so in terms of just going back to the whole role models thing, blogs that I do read from entrepreneurs I really like, Seth Godin is one of them. Mm -hmm. He's a man of few words, but many blog posts. I think he blogs every day, but they're always really short but sweet, very digestible. Um, and he has a lot of wisdom and sense to share about business. Um, another person I really like is Guy Kawasaki. And his um, his perspective on community building, creating relationships with people. Um, I read quite a lot of personal development blogs as well. Um, I'm now trying to think of some off the top of my head. <laughs> I can't. Um, but yeah, those those are the two I would suggest for cool. well, budding we'll, entrepreneurs. Yeah, we'll put those yeah. in the notes. <laughs> Hannah, thank you so much for coming on the show. Would you like to uh, plug anything or give out contact details? Yeah, absolutely. If you have any questions about journaling or um, personal development or anything else that we've talked about today, you're welcome to contact me at Hannah, that's H A N N A H, at becomingwhoyouare.net. Um, obviously, you can visit becomingwhoyouare.net and my book, The Ultimate Guide to Journaling, um, which sort of carries on the conversation that we started today, is available through Amazon, um, Smashwords, iBooks, and it's on audiobook as well. And soon it's coming out in print too, which is very exciting. And it's only $2.99 for your Kindle, people. Go get it. I highly <laughs> recommend it. I'm reading it right now and find it very beneficial. Hannah, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. This has been fun. Thanks again for tuning in to this episode. And I hope you enjoyed Hannah's knowledge and experience and her advice on how to use journaling to produce more freedom in your own personal life. Please come back next week for another episode and rate us on iTunes, subscribe on YouTube. It's really appreciated.